two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the June 21st, 2023 meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with staff liaison may convene an in-person meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. To conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Faya if you must leave the call by using the team's chat feature so that a quorum may be maintained. Ms. Faya, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Ms. Dominowski. Um, Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Here. Ms. Henn? Here. Thank you. Ms. Dominowski, there are three. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Faya, please call the roll of any staff members participating in today's meeting. Mr. Hartlove? Here. Ms. Megan Shea? Here. Ms. Boswell McComas? Dr. Boswell McComas, sorry. <laughs> no worries, I'm here. If there are any other staff members present, please say your name now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Faya. Mr. Hartlett will provide information on the Maryland OIGE for Education Correction Action Plan, SOP, Office of the Board of Education budget, and the committee will vote to approve moving this item to the full board during committee meeting reports. Good um, afternoon, everyone. Um, so yes, uh, this item is a is a cleanup, and we started to talk about it last time. And I went back and did a little uh, research. So this dates back to 2021, in response to uh, an OIGE investigation. The Board of Edu Education included in the Corrective Action Plan development of a standard operating procedure for the Office of the Board of Education's budget. That's not the entire budget, but just the, the board's actual budget. Um, that SOP uh, standard operating procedure was developed and it's actually uh, been in practice. It's, it's, it's so it's it's it, we're actually using it. I, I um, verified that uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so at this point, I think as you said in your opening remarks, Ms. Dominowski, uh, uh, it just needs to be. Um, it actually was voted on once before, but by a prior uh, budget committee, uh, which was, I think, you know, at this point kind of dated. So it probably makes sense to vote for it again. Um, so then that the chair can then take it to uh, the next BOE meeting for for approval. So um, the SOP was included in the backup for this meeting if you want to look at it. Yes, I did look over that. Um, I don't know if there any other members here have a question for Mr. Hartlove about this. I do, Ms. Domanowski. Yes. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mr. Hartlove. Good evening. Um, this is Ms. Hen. And last time we were discussing um, the SOPs used by other offices and the committee expressed a desire to look at those SOPs in comparison to this. And I believe that was information we had requested, um, which is why we postponed voting on this, if my memory serves me correctly. You you are correct. We did have that discussion as, as well. Um, we looked into it. Uh, other than the overall SO, you know, the, the overall procedures in the budget office, there isn't one for um, other departments. This was developed in response to that to that investigation. So that's why, you know, as part of the as part of the corrective action plan, it, it, it was developed. Um, so so yeah. we did look and there and there aren't for department by department um, SOPs for how they do their um, individual budget. OK, and thank you for providing the background information on this. I understand it was developed in response to the OIGE report. However, at the time, 
um, I think I'm the only member that was on the board at the time, right. a little more context here. We had discussed developing it to be consistent with other departments practices and wanted to ensure that we weren't the outlier or doing something that was, you know, contrary to um, standard procedure for the rest of the school system, because that doesn't make sense. That's where mistakes happen when you and that's how um, we got into trouble in the first place, I think, is because our practices were different and board board office accounting was handled slightly different than everyone else. So we emphasized the need to standardize what we approved around what everyone else is doing so that staff, you know, we don't want there to be mistakes, right? That's the goal. Right. And I think it's important for us to see how this compares because we we don't want to be the one off, right? There are going to be right. minor things, of course, with with the board that that may be different, but I I still feel it's important to see the overall SOP and that we're not reinventing the wheel here. Right. Yeah. And and I think when it was developed, and I wasn't here when it was developed, but I think it was developed in what the the practices are. Those practices, I don't believe, um, um, are are in writing. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's unfortunate and that's certainly something we can work to develop. Um, my only concern at this point is, is that we do have the corrective action plan that we said we were going to do this. So we probably we we and the fact is, like I said, we're already actually practicing this in the in the uh, um, Ms. Gover is already practicing um, um, these budget, uh, the, the things that are in the SOP. So um, certainly we can look to formalize the budget offices overall um, SOPs, but I'm, I'm just concerned that if we waited that may take that may really delay this and then we wouldn't be responsive to the corrective action plan that we put in place. So that's the only thing I'm saying at this point. We're kind of like it's kind of like housekeeping to get us back on track with what we said we were going to do. Um, I understand our, and I, yeah, I want to be yeah. responsive to that office as well. Yes. My concern is if we move forward with this, then it's done and forgotten. And we're not putting the budget office practices in writing, and that's critical. It was a recommendation of the public works report um, that those procedures be in writing, not, not just for the board office. Again, we shouldn't be the anomaly here. We should be standardized across the school system so that we are all implementing best practices. And, and I understand what you're saying, Ms. Gover has been implementing this. It's been in place quite some time now. However, this is an impetus for improvement throughout the organization. And if we slide this through and it's it's done and not heard about ever again, my concern is that we're not going to see the procedures implemented um, throughout because those do need to be in writing. And, and I'm hearing you state that it's the budget office has processes and procedures. I'm sure they do, yes. but they need to be in writing. And that was not, that's not just me speaking it. Public Works recommended that. And I believe that OIGE would, would support that as well, given their findings. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Domanowski and see what other committee members think. I have a, some input on the on the standard operating procedures. Um, so, Mr. Hartlow, thank you for this. I do think it's um, it's a good start, uh, but I do think that this document could be strengthened. I feel like there are some critical pieces that are missing so that we're as transparent as possible with the public regarding how we um, operate with our budget. Um, and, and I understand that the organization doesn't have one, and so maybe we could be the model for which the the uh, rest of the school system can can build their standard operating procedures off of. Uh, but I'm thinking. So the first thing is um, what I feel like is missing is what what are the goals of this standard operating procedure? You know, I would love to see some some smart goals that aligns to like the overall purpose of you know the some smart goals that align to um the operations of the budget and then how the uh operating procedures align or they help to support the implementation of those goals um so that's one thing that i think um 
is missing. Um, the purpose can be strengthened as well. Like while I recognize this is to outline the, the management practices for the Office of the Board of Education, um, we, we could go a little bit deeper. And I'm almost feeling like, do we need to have a work session where we really sit and kind of work through this document and how it looks so that it can be the model for other standard operating procedures if the agency so so chooses. But for the board, I definitely think that um, we need to get a lot more detailed in this. Um, and then I would just hesitate with defining specific, um, you know, like we here it mentions Excel budget tracking workbook. Um, so that doesn't that doesn't create uh, flexibility and technological tools that may be used to track a budget. Um, Excel is great, but there may be another tool that can use a more advanced option other than Excel. So I would I, I don't want to call out a specific tool. I would rather the action focus on, um, you know, what it is we're going to do, not necessarily the tool that's going to be used so that this can be a, a living document and we can uh, adapt with with the advances in technology. Um, and and so so I don't think this is ready to be taken for a, for a, a vote. I do think that there's more work that needs to be done, and maybe this is a, an agenda item where we just have a working session where we walk through the components of this document. Um, and then even with the time frame, I, I think we need to get more granular with that. So we say weekly or it's needed. Um, for I'm looking at step one. You know, I would like to see. You know, the third by every Monday we will see this. When there's something that says monthly, then I would want to know, you know, the first business day of the month, we will see this so that it's very clear to everyone what's going to happen when. And, um, and you know, even when I was reading over the documents that were included with this from the from OIG, from the um, Office of Inspector General, um, and I was looking at the the response, I, I just feel like we just need to get more granular with the way that we're doing things so that it's it's clear. And if this could be in somehow an online format so that anyone, so if it's not a static document, but it's a dynamic tool um, so that anyone, um, any Baltimore County taxpayer can easily log on and to see our standard operating procedures and see where we are at any given month within implementing those standard operating procedures. Thank you, Ms. Booker. Yeah, I, would, I would agree. And all I can, yeah, I, I don't know how these were developed because I think these were developed back in, it says implementation date, July 1st, 2022. So I think these were developed a, way, a ways back. Um, really, I think the only reason this was brought was just to clean up the fact that it never, it never went to the full board, so uh, but we certainly can go back and revisit it. That's not a that's not a problem. So, so right now we don't. Our next um, meeting isn't scheduled till September. If we could potentially put in a work session where we just focus on this and ironing out what we want in it. I'm thinking in August. Give us July because there's a lot going on. Um, you know, 16th or the 23rd. If either of those dates work with anybody, we could just have a work session and just focus on this, what we want in it. And I don't know, that, that's my comment. Any others? And I, also think, oh. yeah, and I also think that a standing agenda item should be where, where that the budget of the board and where we are with the spin down, all of that should be a standing agenda item for this budget committee where we're always looking at the budget of the board and we are monitoring it to ensure that we won't get, you know, there won't be another corrective action plan that's needed for the board or that we don't overspend anything. So how would how would you suggest that is done though? Um, do that mean like going through all of our contracts or? I agree with you. I'm just wondering how how we do that and do other things. And so we and so would it simply be a, a presentation of and it could be in whatever format that the budget is is tracked in of, you know, this is the amount that we have. This is the amount expended thus far. 
um, for each of our budget categories. Okay, uh, Ms. Han, you had a comment? I do, thank you. I agree, this needs to be done, um, but I feel like we're getting into the operations and that it's not the board's role. Um, the expertise here lies with Mr. Hartlove and his team. And I would like to see, since he was not around when this was originally developed, I would like to see something to start with um, for us to review in, in terms of getting the expertise that we already have in the system, in our, in our staff, and we have amazing staff, to develop this and to develop a master one that we can provide input on. Because if you look at our overall budget, the board office budget is not even a drop in the in the proverbial bucket here. We need a master SOP that can be brought to us for input and that can be implemented universally. And it sounds like there, there's one already in practice, but we need to start from that. I'm, I'm still concerned that we're trying to reinvent the wheel and be a one off here. And I know we need to get it done. It was a finding, but I want to see what the rest of the school system is doing. That's my priority, and that's what we should be following suit, not creating something outside of staff because it we need their expertise to do this. And I would like to see something brought back to us to say, here's a proposal. This is or a recommendation of what we're going to implement system wide because we should be following that, not creating our own. I appreciate that comment. Um, we, I, I believe we need to establish a structure for governance and that is what is missing. And so, and so that working session will help us establish that structure upon which we can then have the information to uh, effectively govern. Um, Mr. Hartlove has already identified that they don't have it uh, right now in their school district. And this is not for this is this is not the standard operating procedures for the school system. This is for the board's budget. And so we do have to get into the operations of the board's budget because it's our budget. So I'm not saying we develop a standard operating procedure for the school system. It is for the board um, because that's what the corrective action addresses. Um, I, I think it, it would be great to have that information um, and to have a model of, of what the school system is doing so that we can um, align with that. But Mr. Hartliff has already said that they don't have it. And so instead of um, trying to pull something out of, you know, then having them try to make up something, then let's establish what we want so that we can govern effectively. Because if not, we'll keep coming back to these meetings and having the same conversation over and over again. And um, and we need that structure upon which to govern, to govern, and we don't have it right now. Understand, but, but respectfully, we are, we're talking about the the financial operations of one office that is such a small piece here that in in terms of overall input input or impact in terms of controls there are SOPs the departments are using we haven't seen those but they exist they it this is not anything new um the office of legislative audits has recommended that the OIGE has has recommended it in our case as a microcosm, but my issue here is we should be following suit. The board office is not an island, and that's what we're treating it as by looking at just a, a tiny piece of the overall financials of the school system. And if we don't insist that we, we come up with a standardized practice, it's it's not going to happen. We're tr we're trying to put the cart before the horse here, and and we should be following the best practices that Mr. Hartlove establishes for the school system because we are one tiny piece of it, and it's not a governance issue. It's just that it's in our roles we should be following the same SOP that the rest of the system is following. We shouldn't be creating our own. We shouldn't be the exception to the rule, and and I think it does exist. I'm I'm hearing differently, and maybe. Mr. Hartlov, you'd like to speak to this. There is an SOP in, in place. Departments abide by rules. We just need to see what those rules are and commit the board office to following them as well and, and providing input. But groups like the OIGE, um, Internal Audit, OLA, those are the groups that 
can review it. We could, you know, ask for their input here. But I, I don't see the need to start from scratch when we should be following best practices for the school system because we are just one office of the school system. So, just Mr. Hartlow, back to you, Mr. Domanowski. Can I just jump in real quick because I, I want to try to put both of those in together. I, I think that you both have, I, I'm understanding both sides of this, this, this argument. And I agree with both of you. I think that we can do both as far as we can set a standard while incorporating standards that are already in place. I'm wondering if we can ask that other departments follow suit with what we come up with in conjunction of what's, you know, it, right now we're hearing that there isn't a standard operating procedure. They, there's not something coming forward with us. So if that's true or not, I don't I don't know, but we are in a position where we can start from scratch. Figure out what how we want this. Small portion of the budget to work, but thinking that we want all the other portions of the budget to work the same way. They want to be accountable, want to be a transparent, want to that recommendation should go to other departments as well, and we should get there. Uh, should every department should come up with the same standard operating procedures that we are coming up with. And is that something that we can um, put in a policy or put in recommendation or get from other departments so that we know that we are all working together on the same page? Is that understood? It is, Mr. Menonowski, may I comment on that? Sure. It, again, to provide some historical context here and why if I sound agitated, I am a bit because it's been years since we were told that individual departments were developing these. This is not the first time we are asking for that. And had we received that when it was originally requested or, you know, within six months, within a year, the the prior board leadership requested those SOPs from the departments as these were being developed. And Ms. Gover um, assisted in the development of these along with the chief of audit and it was done. And we were told at that time that departments were build, were creating their own SA, SOPs. So, you know, it's deja vu, but we're not getting anywhere by asking for this, which is why I'm hesitant in, in taking this approach. We went down this path. We said we were going to develop one. The other departments were going to follow suit and they have not. So we need to do something differently here because it's it's not moving the needle. And mm -hmm. I'm looking for leadership in from our um, budget office to tell us what is in place. You know, I, I didn't get an answer last time when I asked this about the status of the SOPs and other departments. And if something's in practice that's not in writing, that needs to be put in writing and we need to see what those are. And again, not develop something outside of what's already in place because I believe some best practices are in place and and I'd like to review those while we it if it's to to build something better that's great and I'm all about governance and I agree with Ms. Booker Dwyer a, a hundred percent but we've been down this path and I'm I'm looking for leadership in terms of a central and it's in the operations it's not the board's role I want operational leadership on this issue to bring us a master SOP for budgetary processes because one needs to exist. We've had multiple outside agencies telling us we we need one, and I think the committee agrees we need one. So I've said enough on that. Thank you. And, and if, I, if I may, I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt the conversation, but um, I I want to make sure I don't mislead anybody. I know we as an organization have standard operating procedures for many of the things that we do. This was very specific to a procedure to outline budgetary management practices. And, you know, I believe most of the items of how to manage a budget are in writing or in memos, in standard memo, standard uh, uh, documents that go out to departments, they just may not be in a standard operating procedure. And, and and I even want to back off on that a little bit too. We may have the standard operating procedure for the entire operation 
of the budget. We just may not have department by department procedures for outlining budgetary management practices at that department level, because it is a very, very specific thing that this is this is for. I'm not saying it's not needed. I'm just saying I don't want to I want to make sure that you don't come out of this with the 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 picture that we don't have anything in writing um, as an organization. I believe we do. I'm not the expert on all the SOPs across things that are non budgetary and non financial, um, but I believe that there are many standard operating procedures in place. Um, I, I was very when I heard the conversation last week, I was very I was looking very specific for other departments, standard operating procedures for the management practices on budget, and we don't have them at a department level. Um, I can recheck to see if we have something at the system wide level, which may be. Kind of all we really need. Um, so but uh, but let, let me check to make sure we have it first and, and then go from there. But I just wanted to make sure Ms. saying because I heard you. I know you were you were getting upset and I, I wanted to just make sure not something that I said didn't take you down too far down a road of, of being upset when I you know, I want to make sure that I'm not saying across the board we have no standard operating procedures. That's not what I'm saying. Thank you, Mr. Hartlove. And I believe that's what we were asking for at the last committee meeting was to review those. And, and I understand they may be informal. They may be in memos. Each department probably has their own practices. This is an opportunity, right, for us to to have a standard and I, I don't think we need to start from scratch here if we have some idea of what the departments are doing and and to have even a rough outline. Um, because my my fear is that we we go forward and we develop a board office SOP and and that's what it becomes. It's just for the board office and it's so particular and so unique to our needs that it it can't be adopted. And we have. This is the impetus for us to lead and say, no, we need something organization wide that doesn't exist. And if we don't take this opportunity to do it, it won't happen because no one has taken responsibility for developing it. So I move that the committee ask staff to bring back to a subsequent meeting a template for the SOP based on that can be used system wide based on current practices. So I think that's kind of what I was going to end this with as far as our next work session is that we have whether it's memo, informal, whatever we have as other departments system wide standard operating procedures to bring to the next work session for us to come with up with an outline of how we want to develop as the board of our budget, but then also we need to insist that other departments come with something, come up with something more formal and that will be posted in public and made public as well. And all of those things will be done and agreed upon at the same time. OK, so there's a motion on the floor, Ms. Domanowski. Do you want to ask? I'll for second that motion. Yes. Rod McMillian, I'll second the motion. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And and I, uh, if we're going to have discussion on this. Yes. I just want to, you, you know, it, it's very interesting. I I love to hear intellectual dialogue, and I love it going. And, and I'm I'm stone serious on this, and I'm not stone, but I'm serious. <laughs> uh, and, and I and I just I love that piece of this. There's no doubt in my mind that these departments have guidelines that they follow, and we all agree to that. But they're not standard, and they're and they're and even if there's memos and this and that, they need to be standardized, and we need all of them following. Look how how simple it would be if all of our departments follow. We see what they're doing, and and some of it might be really really good, and and all of them are following the same standard of procedure when it comes to this topic. And look how easy it would be for the public to then go on and if the public's looking for something specific, it's their tax dollar. 
And they they some of the people want to follow their tax dollar and they should have every right to do that, in my opinion. And so if we standardize it, I just think it would make it so much easier for the for the constituents, the people out there that are really interested and want to do this. Thank you. I'm done. Thanks. And I, I agree with, with Rod and I, I appreciate the motion um, to bring back a template. Um, but just I would I want to amend that motion and that, yes, please bring back a template. But we have a work session to work through that template, because once again, these are the standard operating procedures for the board and we are the board. Um, and so there needs to be some in-depth discussion. Um, we need to be able to provide some some clear input to guide the direction of this template, uh, because these are the board standard operating procedures. And while there should be connection to what the school system is doing, know that the school system is a, it, 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 the way that you will manage a billion dollar entity and the way that you're gonna manage the little pot of money that the, the school system has, that the, um, that the board has, there's going to be some nuances to that. So we need to make sure that our standard operating procedures address the nuances for the board. Um, and, and I just I don't want us to lose sight of that. So I want to ensure that when this template is brought back to us, that we will have the time to go through it, to modify it and to truly have a work session around it. And with the template, um, I want to know the research that was used to inform it. And so not just the um you know the anecdotally what departments are doing but there's research behind what goes into effective standard operating procedures for a budget and so i want to see the references that were used to inform the development of that template and and i want to ensure that the template is something that can be transferable into an online platform um not just to have a static document. So I would love to see what, um, how this template could perhaps be used in a Power BI or something like that so that it's not a static document, but the public can see in real time how these operating practices are being implemented. So I just want to amend the motion to include that there is time for us to truly work through that template. And it's not just a template presented to us and we vote yay or nay, that we're working through um, each component of that template and that there is a there's a strong reference list behind the research that was used to inform the development of that template. I'll second that amendment wholeheartedly agree and approve. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Uh, would you uh, restate the um, the motion, including the amendment in the chat for Ms. Faya so we can vote on it? Sure. I will try to capture that. <laughs> as best <laughs> you can. It requires help. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it in the chat. OK, I, I think I've captured <laughs> the the spirit of this here, but I'll, I'll let you guys decide. Um, would you like me to read this, Ms. Domanowski? Yes, that'd be great. Thanks. Sure. I move that staff develop a comprehensive technology enabled research backed template for budget management standard operating procedures and bring to the committee for a work session for input and further development. Thank you, Ms. Booker-Dwyer. 
for the. Do we have a second? Um, shall shall we vote? <laughs> I always forget how this works. It's, it's in favor of, correct? So, um, Ms. Fayo, will you call the vote? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I just realized I was on mute. So sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Faya. Um, I said yes. Did you get that? Are you there, Ms. Dominowski? I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. I said yes. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Faya. Moving on. Uh, Mr. Hartlove, please provide an overview of the turf field inquiry. Um, sure. At last uh, last meeting, uh, we talked uh, um, about the uh, a specific item that had gone to buildings and contracts for turf fields. Um, we um, we talked that the information we gave was that uh, the contract was a uh, one that we piggyback from the county. It includes design and installation services for outdoor and indoor turf fields, um, which uh, could include turf based construction, turf installation and field amenities. Um, um, it was also for installation of artificial turf systems, including draining uh, draining systems. It's also for seeding, sodding, top dressing, a aeration, watering, fertilizing, um, and we also talked about um, the contract would allow us to install turf fields if funding is available. So the question came up about the $6 million that's in the anticipated lifetime contract expenses. And the reason um, part of this was 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 a funding that we were. Um, we were pretty sure we were going to get and we ended up getting it's uh, we, we went for two uh, existing grants through the Maryland State Capital Capital Grants, uh, $1.3 million each at Kenwood and Parkville um, high schools. Those uh, we did get those grants. The funding is in place and the construction is scheduled to start this summer. So because we have the uh, the contract in place, we can we can move forward. Uh, the remaining spending authority was intended to cover potential future projects and also maintenance and repair work. So we don't have six million dollars of funding lined up. We have we had the uh, two point six. Uh, plus the other do dollars we have in our budget for maintenance and repair work. And we're certainly looking for other uh, avenues to get uh, our future grants to get other fields done. And if we do, we'll have that uh, contract in place um, to do those turf fields. So hopefully that answers your questions, uh, Mr. McMillian. It just all seems kind of, you know, you at one point early on in this conversation, you, you referenced outdoor and indoor artificial turf is that correct that one of yes, those first I think that's, yeah and, and and the county bid bid this out and i think you know they, there's probably some generic language that they use um it, so it's i wouldn't get too i, I was pulling that right out of the out of yeah, the but, out of the contract you know, but to me that contributes to the confusion we don't have i don't know i've taught 35 years in this system I was an athletic director 25 years. I don't know anybody that has indoor turf. So, I, right. you know, that just so some 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 Joe that's watching this thing. Oh, Christ, where do they get indoor turf right. to, you know, for? Right. And and then I think it's it's and I don't mean to call it a shell game, but the whole thing, that's six million dollars. You just it, it you, you know, it comes before a budget, it, it, the building and contracts. So we think that there's six million dollars there. 
And but there's really not six million dollars there. It's two point six is is grant monies, and then this other money, and then and then when they tie in with the artificial turf piece, they tie in, you know, all this natural uh, 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 the seeding and and all the different things right. with the natural soil. So it just seems to me that that's it ought to be two different things, and and it ought to be the money ought to be there and and not. You know, it just it just it's confusing to me. And, and I think I've got a little bit of a handle on it. So that's the piece that's upsetting to me. Thank you very much for listening to me. The logic behind uh, behind this, I believe. Well, first of all, we we piggyback the county bid. So it was their bid. We didn't write it. Um, but there is when when we're looking for funding, you know, we are optimistic that we may get more and we want to be ready to strike if we get it. Had we been pessimistic and said, we're only gonna get one of these, we'd only have a contract ready for 1.3 million. The other 1.3 million, we would kind of have to wait until we put another contract in in place. Um, so there is a, we are trying to uh, uh, look for many possibilities when we put a contract out there. Uh, we would, you know, it, 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 we may start to really slow down if we, only bid things when we absolutely know we have the money. Um, so uh, that is that is something that we've been struggling with. That's what our last meeting was about, the difference between the um, between the budgeted spending authority um, or the contract spending authority and, and the budget. You know, they, they are two different things um, and we are, you know, and we are trying to set ourselves up to be ready um, you know, for you, Mr. McMillian, you, you know that when you put these fields in, there's a timing that you want to do them over the summer. So we do, you know, that's part of the reason why we want to have all this ready to go. So if we are able to get the funding, we can move quickly. So um, hopefully that helps a bit. Yeah, and and really, this is probably the the third conversation we've had had about this after it's come out of building contracts. So none of this additional information was presented at the time of that contract. And to me, that led to confusion. There were athletic directors out there thinking, other than Kenwood and Parkville, I, I had a guy reach out to me and contact me and say, Rod, thank, hey, thanks for the money for the turf field. I'm like, what are you talking about? So if there's a lot of confusion with that. So thank you. Yep, yep, yep. I think that goes in a lot with what I was trying to say as far as these contract authorities. Like a contract shouldn't come before the committee, even if you're asking for them the month, the authority to spend it, if we're not actually prior to, one prioritizing it or two have the funding to do it, because then, like Mr. McMillian was saying, we're giving people the impression that this is going to happen, and I, I, I think in a transparency role, it, it doesn't look, it's not a vote of confidence. Like I, I don't understand why we are um, bringing forward contract authorities that. We don't even know we're going to have the money to fund. Um, yeah, and 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 that's, I think that's a fairly. I mean, my my thought is is that we do it for efficiencies in operations. So when the when the funding and it doesn't always work. It's just working in this way in this particular instance. Uh, we were out trying to get as much funding for turf fields as we could, and we wanted to be ready if we were able to uh, get all of that funding. We wanted to be ready to be to be able to move quickly. Um, if we get the funding and we haven't done a contract, that's a, it's a long process to 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 get a contract put in place, and that could delay fields being um, 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 implemented for a year. You know, or, or or so. It may even put the funding at risk because the funding may be for a specific period of time. And if you can't utilize it, then um, then maybe they you don't get the funding. So um, a lot of generalizations there. I don't want to say that that's the case on every contract we we bring forward. Many of the contracts we bring forward, the funding is already in in place, or we're fairly sure we're going to get it. Um, but there are times when we put something forward because we want to be ready um, if funding is available and funding is not always available. I mean, we do that a lot of times with other things where um, 
you know, we project that funding will be re will be available, but then some other things end up costing us more than what we anticipated and funding that we thought would be available was isn't available and then we can't act on the contract um, because the funding is not there. So it does happen. But, Mr. Manowski, I got I have another question, please. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Hartlove, it was my understanding that Kimwood and Parkville their money came out of the preceding General Assembly and that there was Chesapeake and Patapsco that had talked that they were trying to get money out of this time for their fields, but the money didn't come through from the state. And if it didn't come through the, from the state, then the Baltimore County didn't have didn't have to match that money. Do right. you know anything about can you see on what you have the date on the Parkville and the Kenwood monies? No, I can't. I just know that. Yeah, I, I don't know what the dates are, but what you're saying sounds, you know, it sounds plausible because, you know, it, it sounds like there was a real thought that we were going to be able to do four schools and not two. And that's why we went forward the way we went forward. And then it turns out we didn't get two of the of, of the four. So, um, you know, it didn't work out the way we would have hoped it would work out. Um, but um, I don't know if it would have been better had we only bid out two and then if we ended up getting the four now we'd be sitting here rushing around trying to get another two uh fields bid out um to do those fields and, and mr hartlove do you see my point about combining the the turf fields with the the natural piece of it it just seems yes. to me that those are two different yeah and and, and i uh, and i and i can definitely see that and like i said in this case um, we did piggyback a county bid. So when you piggyback, you kind of either you either have to do it on your own if you decide the piggyback is not you know what you want. In this case, we were piggybacking the county, so I think you know there's part of it is that we're kind of on the same team. So we, I don't know what message it would have given the county if we said that. Ah, we'll, no, we'll go ahead and bid our own out because um, we don't like your bid. Um, uh, but I do get the you know I do get the the concern you know again it, there's a lot going on with these contracts um a lot of things we're trying to accomplish and uh, as much as we can to kind of break that that connection that just because we bid something out we definitely have the money i don't know that that will ever be true because um there are going to be times when we think we have the money and the money ends up not um, our projections could be incorrect or something could last ha minute happen on a grant where we don't get the grant or we find out it can't be used for the thing that we thought it could be used for and now we've bid something out but we can't actually buy it. There's always going to be that possibility that you bid something out and then you can't you can't procure it. Mr. Hartloff, thank you very much for your knowledge and your patience with me. Thank you. That's OK. Thank you. So how do we as a committee recommend to the contracts committee? Because I know recent, not recent, super recently, but there was a contract for the electric buses and there's there's grant money that could have been applied for that hadn't been applied for yet. How do we make contract committee more accountable as far as doing the processes for going after those grants before asking for all this money to pay for these contracts? Because Clearly, we're asking for more money that we don't know that we're going to actually have when we want these things. Yeah, I think it's a catch. It's 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 difficult. It's difficult and it's not again. It's not every situation. There are many situations where we know we have funding and you know it's it, it's pretty cut and dry. Um, and um, but there are situations and I think you're right with the electric uh, buses and that's a, that's a good uh, uh, example where um, you want to be ready if you get the funding. You want to be ready to, to, sh to strike quickly. And um, so, so you're, you're going to bid that out and you may or may not get all the funding that, you, uh, that you're asking for, but if you get all the funding, you're ready to move quickly and utilize it quickly. So there's an advantage of that. It's also potentially a disadvantage in that folks could think for sure we're buying electric buses when if we don't have the funding, we're not going to buy them. But it could also mean that if that's a priority, we would move money from somewhere else to make it happen, which is what I'm con what I'm concerned about in other areas. And like if this is something that we're committed to 
and we've, you know, said we're going to do, and we've allowed the authority to spend that money, we're going to find the money from somewhere else to make it happen when and possibly take away from another contract like new turf fields, for example, when it could have been spent there. And I'm, I'm just saying this as an example, um, but how do we, well, I would like to see a more um, transparent, clear cut way that, you know, we're making all the steps to apply for the grants that it, instead of just, you know, basically allowing a credit card line and having a wish list, like these are things that people that we want in our school system or we wouldn't ask for the contract, correct? Right. And may I comment, Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, when the board approves the spending authority, um, the exhibits were provided specify the source of funds. And, and this may be a question for legal that we, we could follow up on, but it would seem that the governance the proper governance procedure in that case, and I share your concern, would be to approve not only the spending authority, but the use of funds as outlined on that contract exhibit. So that if we expect 10 million in grant funds and get five, then the spending authority is tied to that five. Um, and either it comes back to committee for adjustment, um, which it, it sort of does in a roundabout way through the, the that process, but not tied to any specific contract, but it would be more effective governance, I, I believe, if the contract committee approved the terms of that spending authority as specified on the exhibits that we received. That would be my recommendation. And I don't know if that's a question for legal or we need to take that to, we probably need to take it to both, both the committee and legal for an opinion there. And I would, I think when we had the um, the the funding, it's more of an information item, and in some cases, it's a we don't know for sure because it could be a situation where we're going to there's something we want to procure uh, exactly to your point, Ms. Dominowski, that we want to pr procure. We're going to get it if if we have grant funding. And we may want that item so much that even if the grant funding doesn't come through, we would bring in operating dollars to do that. I mean, some of this is, it, I, I, is the operations of the school system. I mean, some of it is, you know, the transportation folks, for instance, they're going to have a choice whether they buy electric vehicles or diesel vehicles. And some of that, um, you know that that is is part of the management of the department and the management of their budget. Um, Correct, and and understand. I understand that, Mr. Hartlove. I, I, but it, we even though it's an information item, the board is still basing its decision as to whether or not to approve that spending authority based on the information we're provided, and if that information changes significantly and funds are pulled from a critical area of the board, let's say staffing, for instance, because we're not filling our vacancies, then that board decision might be different in, in that case um, versus designated or restricted grant funds just for the purchase of electric buses. You know, that we right. we went out, we got a grant, it's specifically for buses, fine. It's not pulling from the, you know, the classroom and and staffing, for instance. Quite a different matter if the grant funding falls through and we're not filling our teaching vacancies. And I think that does need to come back to the board because that would be a very different decision. And and to my point, it comes back at a high level through the BAT process. But if those terms significantly change on which we based our spending authority approval, then in my opinion, and again, I would need to consult with legal on this, it should come back to the board because the, the terms have substantially changed. And the only and I and I hear what you're saying. The only thing I would add to that is, is you do have another oversight with in the case of, of taking like uh, instructional vacancies that would require a transfer of budget. So we, we can't just say, oh, we have uh, we've saved money because we haven't filled all of our vacancies. So let's go buy some electric buses or let's you know, or let's buy some textbooks. We have to come to the board to say, 
we have savings in uh, instructional salaries. We would like to move those to, and I don't ever see myself being part of a hook back that would move it to, well, I shouldn't say that, but that's something we probably wouldn't do is move from instructional salaries to transportation, unless it really was a high level initiative of the board to say, we really want electric buses and we want to use every dollar available um, to go buy as many electric buses as we can, but that would go through the board as a as a, as a as a bat. The only things you're not going to control at that level are things within a category, like I'm going to buy an electric bus versus a diesel bus or a gasoline bus. That is all in the same category, so we wouldn't need your permission to, you know, we wouldn't have a budget oversight to say. Um, it would just be the oversight of the entire budget that you gave us at the beginning. Um, so that's so that's just a little nuance in, in what you said. Thank you. And yes, and and I I think we're saying the same thing in terms of moving between categories or across categories. The board does approve those transfers and it has been the case where um, we've made movements from instructional salaries to um, C&I or you know, instructional technology from instructional salary. Yes. So there have been significant movements there that my concern is, you know, and this always raises questions as to why the plan wasn't implemented and then we don't get down to the contract level. But to Ms. Domanowski's point, and I think um, what the committee has been saying is that we need greater governance at the contract level when we when we issue these approvals based on information we use that information um, to make that decision and i think if if something significantly changes um, some of those changes are brought back to us some of them were minor ones we get a new vendor um, it's reassigned the company changes its name some of those minor things come to the board but yet if the funding source changes that doesn't come to the board because the contract hasn't changed so i'd like to you know dig into this a little bit more um, right. Because I think that would make the the bat process easier um, and more transparent for our public to know to to be able to follow their taxpayer dollars, like Mr. McMillian said. Right. Well, and I think the other thing too is we've got to watch how far. I mean, I know it's budgetary, but we're also like there is the buildings and contracts um, committee folks that they have to kind of have this discussion there. So. I I, and just because that's what I was going to come in. I think a part of this is built is the the building and contracts committee, and hopefully with the modified template, when whenever we see that, that will um, help. And I also think it's important um, to know when there's a plan. You know, I, I was always told with budgeting, it's better to have a plan and no money than money and no plan. And so mm -hmm. part of what I'm hearing you say, Mr. Hartlove, is that you know for operational efficiency, you have these fantastic plans and you you move forward with certain elements in hopes that grant funding will come through or that the county is going to send some money or we are that the state and so so I'm thinking when when that is being presented it will be helpful for the board to have a clear understanding of okay this is the plan we don't have the money yet but you know do you at late layer one do you agree on the plan and then you know kind of the next layer is this is our thought process to get the money um, and if we don't get the money, then the plan won't go through. But just so that we're clear on yep. what's planned, what's funded, and what is in hopes to be funded. Yeah, I think those are all very good points. And I and, and I would just throw it, and I don't want to you know drag this out, but um, the the main focus of buildings and contracts is what contracts we're entering into and making sure that we're doing a good job of of if we decide we're going to buy a an electric bus that we buy it from the best vendor and get the best price so that's really the focus the focus is less budgetary in nature and it's more you've decided to get something we want to make sure we procure it in the most efficient way possible and i know it sends some mixed messages when we do that that hey they're going to do that they're definitely going to do that or they definitely have this money, um, but that's, and we should do whatever we can do to make sure we communicate that that's not necessarily the case. We are, we are, we are, um, we wouldn't do this if we thought there was no chance of getting funding because that's just wasting time and setting false hopes. 
but um, if we, you know, there may be opportunity, there may be thoughts of, like you said, having a plan in place. So if we do get the funding, that we can utilize it uh, efficiently. So, and that we procure it in in a manner that's fair. That because that's the other part of the procurement process too is is making sure that every vendor who makes a particular product gets a chance to participate because it is government, it is taxpayer dollars. So they want to, you know, if I if I make buses, I should have a chance to sell buses to Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you, Mr. Hartlove. Are there any further questions or comments about this? Hearing none, um, let's move on to the next item. Ms. Shea, please present the overview of the general fund school allocations. If you're still here with us. I'm still here. Um, but I'm <laughs> going to pass it on to Dr. McComas first to start and then she can toss it to me when we're ready. Good afternoon, everyone or evening, I guess now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Ms. Shea. Um, and first of all, thank you as always for the opportunity to come in and um, talk with you about how we manage our taxpayer dollars. We take it as a very serious responsibility um, and we are excited to have any opportunity to talk with you about how we do that. Um, so I, I won't delay it any further. Um, Ms. Shea, why don't you go ahead and let's great. just jump right into the work today. Yeah, that sounds great. So I don't know. Oh, great. Someone is sending it. So part of what, <laughs> and I want to echo Mr. McMillian's um, point about a dialogue. So I'm going to share some information, but I know the purpose of this really was generated from some questions that were asked from the committee. Um, just trying to understand the difference between things that are funded directly from a school's budget versus those that are sort of centrally allocated to the schools and funneled through the content offices. So that's really my intention is to explain the process for how we allocate teaching and learning operating budget funds for instructional materials so that I can also provide a deeper understanding of that relationship because um, sometimes it's a combination where we um, braid our funds and resources and, and I'll unpack that a little bit. Um, so I did want to also just um, on the next slide unpack just a little bit for everyone's benefit and I know some of you know this really well and for some you may be new um, because teaching and learning is just one portion of curriculum and instruction. Um, I wanted to just showcase that for tonight, what I'm walking through are those offices that are within my Department of Teaching and Learning. So that's everything from math and science and ELA and social studies to ESOL and world languages to career and technical education, um, performing arts, PE and health and library media programs and ed technology. Um, so tonight's presentation just talks about those offices, um, but certainly our division also goes on to include special education and Title I and some other parts of the organization. You can go to the next slide. Um, so I wanted to try to synthesize. So the first thing I wanted to level set is around new adoptions. So as you know, we're right now in the adoption of our HMH into reading. Thank you very much. Um, we have recently adopted illustrative math and bridges. And so whenever there is a new system-wide curriculum that is approved for purchase for system-wide use, that initial purchase is completely done centrally. So the office manages that central purchase order, um, materials are ordered and then shipped directly to schools. And so I listed some examples of recent and current contracts in which that was the case. Um, we work closely with schools and use our focus student information system to pull enrollment data for ordering. And the reason that we both use the focus system for enrollment, but then also work with schools is because, of course, as you know, in the spring, schools get their staffing allocations, and that's when buildings make some decisions about, am I going to have four fourth grade teachers this year because my rising third grade class is a little bigger, whereas the last two years I only had three grade three. So they might need an additional teacher's kit um, or perhaps their population of students receiving special education has grown and they're going to be offering another support personnel who might need his her or their own teaching materials so each um, when we do an initial purchase we work really closely with the staff as well as with the data for enrollment um, and then we do get a little bit of a cushion because as we know, enrollment happens all year long. And so when we make that initial purchase and ship to schools, we do have um, a somewhat of an overage that we try to maintain um, in partnership with our Office of Logistics so that we can keep as close as possible um, the time that we can get any materials to schools should their enrollment numbers change. Um, we also, for some of those new adoptions, work really collaboratively with the Office of Special Education. 
um, and of course Office of ESOL within our because within those initial purchases there might be supplemental or secondary purchases that are specific to the population they serve. So for example, as we're currently working with the HMH into reading, we've been partnering around some of the integrated model classrooms that serve our students in elementary school who are in self-contained settings and what would be the appropriate resource within that HMH to purchase for that population as just one example. So that's how we handle um, the big rocks, those big new system-wide curriculum implementation. Next slide. Um, but we do also have annual budgets for instructional materials that are within the operating budgets for those offices. And there are three way, main buckets for how we allocate materials and funds for instructional materials. Um, the first bucket is by enrollment, and I'll walk through each of these examples in the content areas. Um, so in some instances, those materials are budgeted strictly by enrollment. In other instances, they're budgeted by need and based on school requests. And then a third way that we do it is we do have some strategic plans where we have multi-year plans where we're using different data points to help us identify prioritization in terms of the order of when we support different programs. And I'll unpack that a little bit and then certainly, like I said, want to open it for questioning. Um, next slide. So let me first talk about enrollment, um, which the, the biggest area of our budget for based on enrollment is through consumables. So these are student materials that are consumed through the course of completing that curriculum. When we do our initial purchase, when we come for spending authority requests, we calculate what is the purchase for that initial year and then the replenishment of those consumables for every year within the contract. So that does not get passed to schools. That stays as part of the central textbook. So even though Open Court was adopted four years ago, every year since each um, June, we gather that enrollment data for Open Court and we purchase centrally those student consumable materials. For CTE, we also provide central funding for student consumables, but this is a little bit different because the consumable material is different based on the program of enrollment. So there are different materials, of course, required or uh, dubbed consumable in a culinary program um, versus a construction design management program versus plumbing. And so there are different price points and different costs. So that is still a student consumable cost that is covered centrally, um, but it is done, it kind of crosses over into request because programs tell us and we look at enrollment data for different programs that have a different allocation for those consumables. We also sometimes use enrollment for course materials, so this might include digital licenses. So when I talk about instructional materials, sometimes I'm talking about student consumables and sometimes we're talking about textbooks. Other times we're talking about specific licenses that are driven by enrollment. Um, some examples of that are reading intervention courses or our Project Lead the Way curriculum materials. Secondary visual arts, this is something that um, has been uh, a change in the last several years as part of our work constantly uh, re-examining equity. Um, many years ago, if a student enrolled in a uh, high level secondary visual arts course, so some of our magnet courses or some of our um, advanced courses at the high school, there was a materials cost associated with enrolling in that course. That was pretty common practice across LEAs and it was listed in the um, enrollment guide for the um, course registration guide. And so students, if they wanted to enroll in a course, knew when they enrolled that they would have a fee associated with the materials needed for that course. So if you were in an advanced ceramics course, you would have a, a fee associated with that. Um, as part of our equity work in the last couple of years, we met with students, we met with teachers, we recognized that for some students, just even having that in the registration guide was a deterrent for them registering in those higher level arts courses. And so uh, thanks to Dr. McComas's leadership and working through the budget process, that is no longer the case. Students, we centrally in the visual arts office use enrollment data from the secondary visual arts courses to fund those materials costs so that students do not have to use um, a cost as any type of factor in choosing the courses that they take. 
Another way that we use enrollment is sometimes based on the number of teachers um, because some of the materials are purchased as class sets. So a most recent example of that is our elementary visual arts. Um, most of our elementary schools have one elementary visual art teacher, but some of our larger schools do have like a 1.5 or a second art teacher. And so some of our materials are purchased as class sets, and then we use actually a different enrollment number, which is the number of teachers or sections um, that we need to help support with those materials. We do each year, as I mentioned, um, have support for enrollment growth. And so that automatically comes when we talk about student consumables, but it does also inform some of our budget for additional teacher kits. So each year for our core content areas, we work closely with schools. They let us know I'm going to be adding a fourth grade. I'm going to be adding another ELA teacher so that we can make sure we use those funds centrally to provide for that enrollment growth. So that's basically all the enrollment piece. Yes, Ms. Hen, all of the um, materials cost for those um, high level arts courses are funded centrally. Yeah, yeah. Ms. Hen, I'll just add and Ms. Shea had mentioned it. Once I, once I became aware that that was happening, I was like, that's not acceptable. It, students should not be deterred from taking a higher level course because it, it costs them something. This is this is a you know pre-K. Uh, 12 uh, school system, all students should have access to that. So we we took care of that right away. Thank you, Ms. Shea and Dr. McComas. Sure, all right, next slide. I have another, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, please. Yes, uh, please, <laughs> I'd rather. So with enrollment and okay, every year our students get this school supply list, right? That's a part to me of instructional materials. Parents go out, and they buy all of these things on this school supply list only to have, um, you know, five pages in a notebook used in a class right. or to not even have some of the, the folders that were purchased used. So could you talk a little bit about, um, about that school supply list and how it's reviewed to ensure that the, the, those materials that, that, you know, be, are being requested of the parents to purchase are actually needed and will actually be used. I mean, even down to with some of these advanced math classes and they're, they're putting the TI-82 calculations mm -hmm. and then they're not even used in some classes. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I know that this may or may not kind of, but just in thinking of instructional materials, I'm also thinking of just the student supplies and yeah. how much families are spending only to, you know, only to not to have materials used. Right. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about it because we agree we don't want parents wasting resource. They money's too precious for everyone uh, to waste it in any way. Um, so, Ms. Shea, you, I was going to say, one, I'll let you speak first and then I'll fill in anything that I think needs to be added. I'll just put out that um, a lot of those, um, there's, we're going to need to make a distinction here between what we as at like sort of the central level put out and recommend um, and then individual classroom teachers or teams of teachers who come together and say these are the things we're asking kids to have every day. So Ms. Shea, if you want to add, you know, kind of build that out a little bit. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, you are spot on in terms of, and, and I can actually connect it back to an enrollment um, point for the same theory about use. What do we actually need and what do we actually use? So mm -hmm. as Dr. McCormick pointed out, those school supply lists are actually generated by the schools. School teams of teachers get together um, really around this time of year, May and June, and identify what they are required or requested to update those school supply lists because we get requests from Target and Walmart to, to provide them. And some of them do need to continuously be re-looked at because some of them look the same as when I was in the classroom. And we know that that's a lot of why, especially um, when some classrooms rely more heavily on Schoology or learning management systems, System, oftentimes that's where those notebooks come home and they've only used one or two pages. Um, so Dr. McComas is right, that's largely owned by schools and we certainly partner with our um, friends in the Department of Schools to really encourage them to be in partnership with schools and, and thinking about that. The part that my offices work with is we do provide within our curriculum courses what are the materials that would be helpful. So we do try to streamline and update um, so for example, in our elementary science, we used to mass produce 
um, these write in booklets for some of the elementary science curricula. The feedback from schools was the kids didn't like them, the teachers didn't use them, and it wasn't an efficient use of money. So then we shifted into OK, then we want to add to the school supply list this marble notebook and we'll provide the resources. Then we got feedback from schools. No, we don't want to do that anymore because we're only using a few pages. So now the notebook is electronic and it's only by request. Schools that have said in our community, print is better than we order for those specifically. So we used to take a much more, we're going to order it for all 108, and that wasn't the most cost effective or efficient um, because different teachers have different styles and different grade levels have different familiarity with the use. So part of what I'm trying to illustrate is that it is an iterative process, but I think your point about being in community with families and teachers actually looking at those supply lists. Um, and one thing I know some of our schools are trying to do is to make the supply lists by semester because we also have the opposite problem where children have lost every pencil they've ever seen in their life by November. <laughs> um, and so we also want to make sure that that uh, again, we're not over purchasing and, and having uh, parents come with those dollars. So I think it's a, a point worth taking back to continue that conversation with the Department of Schools. Um, because as Dr. McComas said, we're tonight are mostly talking about the things our office funds directly, which are not school supplies. But I did want to illustrate how we try to help inform those school supply lists. So we try to keep it um, to as much as, as necessary. I can tell you as a mom of three in BCPS, sometimes those folders come home and my kids never want to use the same ones again the next year because that teacher wants a different color or, you know, so so I definitely understand that 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 challenge is something that we need to continue to address. But the other piece that I wanted to put in that relates to the same thing that you've referenced is we've also been in conversation with schools about consumables. So not every school prefers to use the actual workbooks. So in some schools, as you visit as board members, you may go into an illustrative math classroom and the teacher has printed from the illustrative math site just that problem or just that task because it was too distracting to have a whole um, consumable book on the desk. So we are constantly in conversation with schools around, are you a school that's going to use the digital materials? Because then of course there's a paper cost associated with that, or are you going to use the consumables? So to date, the schools have still chosen to use the consumables, but I just share that as a way of, we are trying to continuously reflect on the process to make sure that we're not just automatically buying things on um, rote you know, inertia, but we are actually trying to think about because the same thing could potentially happen where a Bridges workbook could come home and the student has only filled in, you know, half the pages, which does not necessarily mean they've only taught half the curriculum. It just might mean they used a different way. So I just wanted to, to piggyback on your example. Yes, no, I appreciate that. And I bring that up because then I wonder, does that impact the implementation of curriculum? Yeah. So if we know that assessments are digital right. and we know that, you know, the more practice you get in the digital world with taking those that the better the student will do. So if yeah. we still have teachers with pen and paper and they're requesting that the parents buy these notebooks to do pen and paper and then they're wondering why their kids aren't performing well in math um, on those state assessments. So so that's kind of I feel like it's all correct. Sure. It, 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 there's a way that we can kind of align all of that so that the supplies that they're using matches you know Match, what's required right. by the curriculum and and i get it i love a good pen, pencil and paper math sure. problem or or english language arts but the you know if the students want to perform well on on these state assessments and on these national assessments or or, or you know anything that we we have to then i think just start to look at comprehensively i mean maybe not leave so many things to the schools especially with that supply list sure. because i, I feel like that is impacting instru the instructional quality or um, the instruction of curriculum as intended. Yep, I, I, I think your point is spot on. It's interesting though, you know, and I think so many of these conversations are about balance and intentionality, right? Because I recently this spring uh, had to calm down many uh, high school English teachers about chat GPT and the fear around using the computer for writing essays. And one of the solutions was have them write it in class with a good old pen and paper if you're concerned, right? So, so I just offer that, you know, somewhat humorously, but in the reality around, you know, we have to train our students and instructionally be intentional and thoughtful. So that to your point about, 
preparing students for the method by which they're going to be held accountable to demonstrating that success. And so if we know SAT and AP exams are moving in that direction, how are we providing those authentic embedded instructional opportunities for students to use those tools? Because using a calculator on the computer is different. Using some of those drawing tools is different and they have to have that embedded practice while also balancing that with lots of different opportunities for students to, to write. So I think, you know, the, the overarching message that you shared around connecting the dots between instructional decision making driving the materials and the purchase of, of um, instructional materials is is absolutely what we have to continue to evaluate. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. You can go to the next slide. So all of those were some of the examples that we do where enrollment largely drives it. But another question that came was about do schools sometimes ask or request materials and the answer is yes. So I tried to illustrate some specific areas. Schools don't need to request bridges materials or open court or anything that's required of the curriculum, but we do get teacher requests for um, things based on repair or use or growth. So one specific example is every year we ask our secondary science teachers to inventory um, and update and you know inspect, if you will, the science safety equipment. This could be things like goggles um, or safety glasses, if you will. Um, and so that could be where schools would submit a request and by request, I just mean they're letting us know how many. It's not an approve or deny, right? They just let me know this is the number that they need. Um, we also do that with our instrument repairs and instrument purchases. So we do have a supply of system instruments. We also do open it for students to, and families to rent instruments that they can ultimately purchase themselves. We work with vendors to support instrument repairs, and so schools will let us know when they have uh, student instruments that need to be repaired, and we actually have centralized funds that we use to pay for those repairs. Um, schools just let us know what they need, and we coordinate that centrally with the vendor um, really as a service and support to schools so that our instrumental music teachers are teaching. And they just let us know that um, this is a repair that they need. The only time those repair requests are denied is when we determine that it's a lost cause and it needs to be replaced. And then we have a separate funding um, that's used for replacement of instruments or music and dance materials. We also get school requests when materials have been damaged. Um, so we've had in the last couple of years where you know we'll have a school have a flood or has a roof leak in a book room. And when that happens, sometimes that goes beyond what schools can handle within their budget because they hadn't planned to have to do that. And so we do work collaboratively with schools to use um, some of our central funds to support that when it's needed. Um, and then we do also work with schools specifically around individual student needs. So the most current example that's happening right now is in some of our camp opportunities. When you see some of those registration opportunities, um, again, if a student is a great candidate for participating in a camp and the family is interested but doesn't have the funding, we do set aside some funding centrally to have scholarships so that we can eliminate that as a barrier for any student that wants to participate in some of those offerings. And oftentimes our schools are key partners in helping us be aware of that because they have those relationships with the students and their families. So those are just some of the examples. I know Mr. Hartlib has a very detailed spreadsheet of lots of um, information, but I wanted to bucket um, what are the things that we do sort of automatically by enrollment and what are the things that we do by school need by teacher request or principal request. Um, next slide. And then I mentioned strategic planning. So um, some of our big areas, rather than just waiting for a school to let us know of individual needs like I just described, we do also do strategic planning as content offices. So one big example is our career and technical education has a five-year plan. They model it after our Perkins, uh, the CLNA or comprehensive local needs assessment process. So this can include anything from uh, program innovation. So most recently our artificial intelligence program to try to get ahead of those kids writing their essays in chat GPT or maybe teach them even more ways how to do it. Um, but then also around program changes and adjustments in terms of um, growing the program, uh, making sure lots of students have opportunities, whether it's making sure that we're diversifying by students enrolling by gender or by race and making 
sure that that could also have an impact on uh, materials costs or uh, material selection. So we might revise the curriculum to create a unit within the construction design management um, to showcase opportunities for female students who previously hadn't expressed an interest in that content. Um, we expand some of our culinary arts. Also, we have to be flexible as materials costs increase. So we all know at home the, the price of eggs went up. The same is true for some of our culinary programs. So we use our five year planning program around the health and growth of our different program expansions, as well as any new programs for some of our budgeting needs in central office. Uh, for performing arts, we use strategic planning in three main areas. Uh, we're currently doing an audit of the what we call cafetorium. Sometimes it's an auditorium that sometimes serves as a cafeteria and our stage so that our schools have what they need for lighting and sound to support those incredible productions that sometimes are a part of their coursework and sometimes are a part of an extracurricular offering. But either way, we want to make sure that we're partnering with schools to make a strategic plan about how to fund those in priority order. We do the same with expanding opportunities for dance classrooms in partnership with the Office of Facilities. And so we usually have a multi-year plan where we want to make sure that there's interest in enrollment and staffing so that then we make sure that we have the appropriate facilities and not the other way around, that we invest in the facility for a classroom for a course that we don't have a lot of enrollment or staffing for. Um, and then another example is our marching band. Marching band uniforms are extremely expensive because they are hand sewn, um, but we do want our students to, to look their best in representing their school pride. So we have worked with our high schools to um, do an audit of our marching band based on relative age and condition of their uniforms. And we make a multi-year plan strategically to make sure that we try to keep in partnership with schools. And some schools just need a portion of their equipment. One school I remember we purchased just gloves needed to be replaced, but the uniforms were in good condition. Others didn't have uniforms at all. So we use that to help us create a priority multi-year plan for or the annual funding that then we try to distribute over a couple of years to support those needs. Um, and then, of course, this year recently, um, as you know, we have been working to serve more of our multilingual learners in their comprehensive high schools. And so we do, um, as part of that strategic plan, make sure that we're ensuring budgeting needs for uh, professional learning, uh, bilingual dictionaries, other materials that might be needed to support that school differentially as they welcome more and more of their multilingual learners in the comprehensive school. Um, so those are our three big buckets of how we allocate. I know there is also a spreadsheet in which we actually identify this is the amount of money, this is how we um, budget it. Where appropriate on the spreadsheet, we did include a per pupil cost. Um, Dr. McComas always offers us uh, coaching to humanize the process because we're often dealing with very large numbers. But then when you factor in, we're also dealing with very large numbers of students. And when you actually look at it at the per pupil cost, it helps to make it um, a little bit more easy to digest for um, the taxpayers that Mr. McMillian referenced earlier to understand um, how we get to that cost. Um, so that level of information is um, certainly, um, I defer to Mr. Hartlev about um, where that's been shared, but we can certainly um, entertain any questions about the specific level of um, how that annual budget is specifically allocated, like who did I buy violins for last year and which schools needed a cello, that kind of information. Let me just add uh, one more thing that's a little bit of a like a next level up. I know Ms. Shea has been really talking about her department because it's all the traditional content areas, but I will just say that uh, last year as a whole division, we engaged in zero uh, based budgeting process whereby we went through and we examined very um, deliberately what were the actual spend cost over a number of years to ensure that the dollars within the division were allocated where they were needed based on the evidence of spent data uh, and and that aligned with all these things that Ms. Shea was just identifying right so my goal was to make sure that we are optimizing those dollars for our students and that those monies are in the appropriate uh, categories and offices and activities um, and that uh, the need is based on all these three um, things that Ms. Shea just kind of went into detail. So just to kind of let you know that, um, you know, we we take that money management incredibly seriously uh, because we know that um, one, the 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 taxpayers' intent is to have the world a world class education 
for their children, and that's our intent as well. Um, and so I just offer that to kind of seal out kind of how we within our division manage these resources. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. McComas. Um, I love the fact that you did that zero based budgeting. So just as a follow up then to Mr. Hartlove, is that common for all the divisions? Like is there, do you bring all the chiefs together and, and everybody does this zero based budgeting for their, like, because it is a good practice to do. Um, no doubt it's it's uh, something that we it was basically a pilot last year what we did with uh, and Dr. McComas volunteered uh, for it and uh, put herself out there first. Um, and it's something that we you know certainly have, have talked about um, expanding out to other divisions. Um, the and, and, and uh, Dr. Uh, McComas can um, um, attest to this. It's certainly it, it it it's an extra effort. So to do it for the whole system at one time would probably be difficult because it re requires a lot of staff time, both within that division and within the budget it, for support. A lot of we have to run a lot of reporting to support. Um, um, but it, no, it's a it, there's no doubt it's a it's it's a best practice, and it's something that uh, I was very appreciative uh, of, of Mary stepping up and um, some of the things we learned from the from the from the process um, um, were valuable. And yeah, go ahead, jump in. Yeah, I was I was just gonna say, and and your team was very helpful. Um, I had been wanting to do that. Um, for about five years, but as just as I was about, um, I had been in this role for two years and I was getting ready to do it. And of course the world turned inside out and upside down. Uh, so we thought we had other things to focus on. Um, and so we were very appreciative last year of uh, Chris and Witt and the, um, the entire team that helped my team very deliberately walk through that. Um, I would say it, it was an involved process, but it was definitely, I think um, prudent. I thought it was capacity building for all of my offices because uh, we really, it was rigorous. We forced them to really analyze how they're using their resources. What are their budget spending plans each year for those resources? And can they justify uh, that uh, plan and that span spending um, and really force them to look at um, past history? So it's not a, I intend to spend it this way, but history has told me that I need this amount of money to support our science kits for our elementary learners. Um, and therefore I know every year I need to budget at least this amount, plus maybe a little bit more for inflationary uh, costs, right? And so um, I just offer that um, to support the conversation and, and to help all of you understand that um, we do take that seriously and, and, um, are, and work intentionally to be very responsible. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. I think it. I, I can also add it helps us spend every penny, but you know, mm -hmm. this year's dollars for this year's kids. And I say that, you know, the instrumental music was budgeted $210,000 for instruments and repairs, which is hard to predict, right? Because, and they spent $210,059, I'll confess, Mr. Hartlove. We did go <laughs> over by $59, but, but that's the goal, right? Is to make sure that you're budgeting so closely that you are, are making sure this year's funds. And I think that that process of zero budgeting helped us really reflect on multi years of data and trying to navigate um, while also being flexible enough, we want to be poised to also support schools that have unanticipated needs because we want to make sure that that doesn't ever serve as a barrier to that world class education. And um, we're also um, have increased our opportunities across the department for communication so that we're able to say if there's an unanticipated need in ESOL or in um, math and science budgeted for more safety equipment than schools needed, we're able to support the whole child in that way so that we're actually um, continuously in communication with each other through this budget processing as a whole division to make sure that we're, we're doing that well. Thank you. Ms. Domanowski, if Ms. Booger Dwyer is finished, I had some questions. Yes, go ahead. Ms. Booger Dwyer, were you finished with your question? Okay, thank you. And good evening, Dr. McComas, Ms. Shea. Hi. Thank you for this presentation. This has been 
incredibly helpful. I have a few questions and I'll try to be brief. Um, I could talk to you both for, for hours um, and appreciate your time, but thank you very much. My first question is, when recommending a new curriculum purchase, how do you determine the total cost of ownership and are those costs absorbed within your budget or are they spread out across budgets? And how does what does that process look like in terms of collaboration? If you could speak to that. Sure. Yeah, so I'll go start. And of course, you know, Michelle and I are um, right hand, left hand in so many ways. So um, we when we we as she had said earlier, when we're doing an, a brand new purchase, let's say into reading, right? We take on uh, the cost of purchasing that in the initial um, purchase. And we also then plan every year on uh, budgeting to uh, buy the replacement workbooks, right? Those consumables that we know year after year we need to buy for the whole system. Um, but there are instances where schools then also pick up some costs, right? And so, Michelle, I'll hand that over because I kind of laid out when it's a brand new new thing as opposed to like a, a let's say physics textbooks that have already that we've done the one time purchase. It's not a consumable issue um, and maybe you know some students lost their textbook and the, and the principal may need to purchase one or two. Um, so Michelle, you can probably expand on. And, and before you do, I just want to make yeah. sure that I'm clear in wording my question. I'm thinking about other costs that may not be necessarily professional that contract. Professional. Oh, I see. I see. I'm exactly. sorry. I, I knew I, I, I could. I, I answered themselves. Yeah, I professional learning it. and and if that even even to include an incentive for staff, we see other LEAs offering this now for summer professional development and those are requests that haven't necessarily come to us, but we know that we continue to hear from teachers. They want more professional development, so I'm interested from a budgeting perspective when we do have a new curriculum purchase. How is that factored in and? How do you work with other departments that may have those costs within their budgets? So. Yep. So I was going to actually go the professional learning route, Ms. Hemp, because as you know, it's constantly a top of mind. So we do it in two ways because there's really two main costs associated with professional learning. There's the paying for the training, which oftentimes comes from the vendor and often is built into that initial contract. And so I know Ms. Dominowski at our last meeting was talking about like an itemized spreadsheet. Oftentimes that's where salespeople do their thing, which is not where I enter into it in terms of it'll show up as zero, right? It'll show up as if professional learning is included in the cost, but we do factor that in the initial piece around we know that we're going to need professional learning at the startup, but we're also going to need to build in funding for when you talked about the ownership of the duration, right, of the contract. We can't just um, build in professional learning in the budgeting the first year. So when we work with the vendor, that's on the table. We talk about initial startup for training. We talk about ongoing professional learning for teachers, but also for leadership. And then we also talk about job embedded coaching. So we figure out and typically they package that and different vendors work slightly differently. Oftentimes it'll come as a bundle of days, if you will, and then we have to divide that up over the length of the contract. Um, but the second part that we have to budget, and this goes to your question about working collaboratively, is around stipends for teachers. So when that professional learning is going to happen either outside of hours or in the summer, we do work collaboratively with the Office of Organizational Effectiveness, specifically around the Title II grant. That's a main source of funding for um, teacher stipends. I do also have in the department budget um, some funding for teacher pay that is primarily used for the summer curriculum workshops when we hire teachers, um, but it can also be used for professional learning. And so then my teams, when they come forward for a new initiative, first we identify what's the amount of money we need from the vendor. So that's paying for the actual materials, any renewal of materials or digital licensing for the length of the contract, as well as that professional learning from the delivery perspective. And then they also need to budget on what are the Title II funds or professional learning needs that we can use Title II for, and then any additional training. And I say curriculum development, but I just want to clarify, I'm not writing new lessons for the lessons I just paid for, but there is implementation materials that go with it. So that could include a scope and sequence guide, parent newsletters, materials we use to help teachers bring that curriculum to life in their classroom. Um, that all goes into the calculation when they bring that forward. 
I think part of the reason it doesn't come to you, and, and I agree that it's a whole, and, and perhaps as you guys are talking about all the different ways to capture some of that change, um, because I'm paying teachers, I don't bring a contract for the funding that goes in Title II. Um, this Thursday, we are bringing forward our PD plan for HMH to the Curriculum Committee, where we don't illustrate it by cost specifically, but we do talk about those different factors. Um, the one piece that I want to put in there, just again, in, in the spirit of the conversation, one thing that can be challenging, it's not challenging, it's a good thing, is that we also at the very beginning talk to other offices to see who else might need to participate. So I referenced partnering with special education with the Office of ESOL, Title I. So as an example, oftentimes our Title I schools have funding to be able to provide an extra scoop. So if we're doing a system-wide rollout, I'll give an example from Bridges. When we did the system-wide purchase of bridges, um, we purchased all of the materials. Title I schools wanted to use Title I funding for these parent and student manipulative kits that they could use for their family math nights that are a part of their Title I planning and a part of that community schools planning, which spends against the contract that we had with Math Learning Center that was not a part of our initial planning because that came up as a result of the pandemic and some of the resource they were providing for parents. And that's when you'll see us sometimes come back for those contracts and say we need to adjust that spending authority. So um, we try at the very beginning when we're adopting a curriculum to think about costs associated with materials, with professional learning, and with other offices um, and do our best to forecast what those costs would look like up front. Um, and then if sometimes we have to just be um, dynamic and, and respond to current you know, information. So thank Thanks. you for that information. I, I'm looking forward to um, and maybe even joining the curriculum committee for that presentation on the HMH plan yeah. and would love to see a um, plan that includes costs brought back. We are yeah. budget committee, not in that curriculum. So, yeah, but I would yeah, love yeah. to see that brought back. Um, one of the things I, I have a love hate relationship with some of these vendor contracts that include professional learning because it's rarely itemized, right? right. As you said, and it, it doesn't lend itself towards being transparent. But one of the things I'm always looking for are, what are those costs? How many hours are included in professional learning? Not to get into the weeds, but because we need to get you more resources for professional yes, learning. <laughs> okay, yes, amen. can I say it louder? For I was gonna here? say, yes, amen, yeah. yes, can I we, hear can you. We make and teachers 12 months and then we could, yeah, yeah. We, could, <laughs> right. we could reorganize the whole school year and uh, build the adult work time that includes capacity building into it. Sorry, that's my dream, Ms. Hand. No, that's my dream too, Dr. <laughs> okay. That's yeah. my dream too. And my issue is, or challenge, is we can't get you those resources unless we know what you need. need. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when we ask for a pie in the sky, dream, scenario, whatever you want to call it, I want to see a plan that includes best practice, ideal situation, because again, to Ms. Booker Dwyer's quote, and I love this, it's better to have a plan with no money I loved that too. Plan. Yeah, and I love that. I'm gonna Agreed. cross. But then if the money comes, I'm ready. Right. 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 We we have our plans. Look, I'm ready. ready. So that plan, what I'm I'm gonna ask for, beg for, is that we get a plan going into this next budget cycle that includes those dollars. Yeah. For you know, what does that look like? How many hours? What are the stipends? Not just for limited summer professional learning, but for everything, include it all, because I. We need to see that. The county executive wants to see that. We need to start prioritizing and tiering these requests. And thank you for going through the zero-based budgeting process. That's music to my ears. I love love, love that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's where we need to be. I want to see a yeah. plan with dollars associated with it. And then to follow that up, if we're going to be providing the resources, and let's say we do, we cut you a blank check. No, not quite. But <laughs> we, we provide the resources that you need that needs to be followed up by accountability, right? So I hear you saying you're committed to this, that's awesome. But I also hear the schools are doing their own thing. So my, my follow-up question to that is, what controls or measures do we have in place to ensure that the resources we are provided are being used faithfully and that, that these, these things are being implemented with fidelity at the school level? Um, because if they're doing their own thing, fine, we we want to give our educators that latitude, but at the same time, we're also accountable to taxpayers Results, right, for how right. their dollars are spent. 
Right. I know that's I think, a lot to unpack, but yeah. Well, um, first, if I if I may, first I would just and I put in the chat. I think it it may be helpful if you haven't already had some kind of presentation as a whole committee around the different federal title grants and understand their supplementary role. Title II is one of them, and Title II is dedicated to professional learning for teachers and school administrators. So uh, that's a really important one, Ms. Hen, for this particular focus. So I just offer that. And then second, I appreciate um, because we agree, we you know we work hard and we uh, to bring forward the highest quality uh, resources for our students and our teachers and our desire is to see them implement with fidelity, right? And that does that is where the partnership with the Department of Schools come in. Uh, and and I'm hopeful, you know, we ha will have a chief of schools that I can work hand in hand with. Um, I encourage my team to work um, as closely as possible with the Department of Schools executive directors who, who supervise schools um, and that we work hard to build their capacity so that uh, when we're all in classrooms and schools that we know what we're looking for, we know what fidelity of implementation should look like um, and that we have uh, the right questions to ask, right? Because to your point, we respect teachers, professional expertise. Um, but I would also say, you know, as a as a as a leader and as um, I guess a mother, you know, independence is earned. Right, it's not just given. Like you have to earn a level of independence, and then that needs to produce the productive outcome, right? And I think we're in a time period where we've had so many people come into the profession over the disruption of the last couple of years uh, that we definitely need to recommit to sort of uh, establishing what are those expectations, how do we hold people accountable um, as a as a whole organization. So, Michelle, I don't know if you have anything to add, and I too could talk forever about. Uh, instruction and the resources to support it. Well, and what I can try to do, Ms. Hen, is you know the committee present the curriculum committee presentation is tomorrow, but we can um, add in at, at, at the time of delivery sort of what the number of days are in terms of what was built into the contract. But I love the idea of putting forward. Um, the request in the budget cycle about I need this in this pot, but I also need this amount of money to pay teachers to engage in it because I think part of the challenge that I want to also reference around the payment and that's why the dream is to have sort of this mandatory cycle is even when I fund it when it happens in the summer, it's not required. And so there is a level of challenge built into that, right? So when you talk about accountability, we're getting better with systems where we can publish reports and send to principals. These are the teachers that attended training and these are the teachers that have not um, because that is an ongoing challenge, right? Is, is that you, um, so not only do we need the funding, but we also need those structures so that, um, and so then what we do sometimes is rely on those professional learning days in the calendar um, because at least we know those are required other than the, the, the challenge around those observing holidays on those days, which is a, also you know, a constant discussion point. So I think um, your point about connecting dollars to accountability is, is spot on and something that we talk about. And as Dr. McComas said, does rely on those um, really close partnerships with the schools. Um, what we're trying to, to do um, is learn from rollouts that we've done with other um, and constantly be in that cycle of continuous improvement. So what went well when we rolled out bridges? Um, what was a challenge? What can we put in place structurally for HMH to learn from that piece? Um, part of which is about uh, documenting sort of those expectations that come with attending professional learning and then the expected transfer into teacher practice in the classroom. Sure, because we, we all want a, the most successful implementation of course. possible. Right. And I'd rather see, you know, the, the full price tag for, yep. for what that looks yep. like to come to us. And what I'm hearing is that schools is respond, you know, that they're responsible for Im implementation or professional learning, but at the same time, the purchases are being made by your team. And Correct. there needs to be coordination there. And I I don't really care whose budget it comes out of as long as we get the resources as as we we get. To, yeah. to do it properly. And then you're right, Miche, put those controls in place for the accountability that we're asking for. Um, so I, this will be a continued conversation, but the yeah. more, you can provide us the numbers for the resources you need or work with you know the school's team and say hey this is what we need include this in your budget but no matter where it is it just needs to come to us 
because I would rather, I'm, if I'm going to fight for the resources, and I will, for to get you what you need, mm-hmm. I need to know what, what, know that, what that is like. And yeah. I would rather do that. And that, and let's bundle that in with the spending authorities on some of these contracts, because the vendors, like you said, only include a fraction of what our true needs are. And other LEAs are leading the way with doing some really creative things here and maybe talk to them and and find out how their budgeting process works or how they're structured. And I'll be um, speaking with Dr. Yarbrough as well to understand what that looks like from an organization perspective. And then I'm going to turn it over. I have one last question, and this is a, a kind of very concrete example of kind of what we're talking about. Um, or I'm going to try to apply what you've taught us in this, this slide presentation, Mache, um, about how school allocations are determined. Um, can you speak to library materials and sure. how that annual allocation is calculated and why schools would see a variance in that when there is no enrollment variance? Um, for instance, a reduction in their allocation for library books when they're seeing increased enrollment or flat out enrollment? Yeah, it's a great question. That And I should actually, um, because that sort of spans a couple of different um, categories, um, library books. And so I, I know um, if I need to follow up with what I share to give you more specific information, I certainly can. It's a um, combination of enrollment and relative size, but also age of the collection. And so what I mean by that is you might have two schools across the county that have similar size populations, but historically the age of the curation, so every um, of the and curation of the collection changes. So there is a process, of course, that the library media specialists do that the office supports um, around weeding the collection and really looking at um, circulation data, looking at student interest so that they're constantly updating collections. Um, we have found some schools have done a really nice job over a number of years to keep up pace with that. And so the budgetary needs of expanding and keeping those collections current are not just a function of enrollment, but are also a matter of um, how well does the current collection reflect that process. In other areas, that is a deficit and we need to shift dollars to help bring that uh, collection up to date. And so that's some of the, it's a very um, generalized statement of some of the variants you might see that's not just purely enrollment. So enrollment is certainly part of it. Obviously, Chesapeake Terrace and Perry Hall High have, have different allocations, but then um, you also have to look at um, relative age and that weeding process. Um, the Office of Library Media does do audits of a percentage. I can get you the number of collections where they actually go out. It's a small office of two, but they'll actually go out, work with the school library media specialist and kind of do an audit of the collection and of that process. And then they use that to drive some of the strategic planning. So if they've gone out this year and they've looked at a collection of, say, 15 schools, that might drive drive some of that budget planning of a different allocation to help ensure that, you know, our goal is to have every school's collection be world class, as Dr. McComas said, and also reflect um, the curriculum, the level and interest of students um, and that piece. So that's just a broad, I can give you more specific information just even about how that actually played out this past year, if that's helpful. Um, but to your question about why wouldn't it be just purely based on enrollment, some of that is about that annual process around weeding and updating the collection to make sure it's um, reflective of the curriculum and the students. That That's very helpful. Thank you for that, that explanation and how the moving parts operate together. Um, sure. I, I don't need to get into the weeds on this, but yeah. I do want to ensure again that we are providing adequate resources because Absolutely. it seems like we are changing the allocations and hurting some schools while we're trying to help others. Because I've, I've had um, librarians reach out to me that have said their allocations have, have not been sufficient this year yeah. to replace the materials that need to be replaced. So we're not even talking about building a collection or supplementing a collection just to replace maintaining, those sure. calculation and maintaining. Yeah. And that if it weren't for their principals providing them extra funds to boost that collection above and beyond, you know, above what is provided in their allocation, that they wouldn't even be able to maintain their collections. So I and that's really good feedback because I think, but, but I, you actually. Oh, I'm this, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I don't want to get into the weeds about what happened this year, but I do sure. want to understand how that budget request amount is determined and 
to ensure that we're not hurting some while trying to boost others. I would rather ask for more, ask for what we need and get less, and then we figure out what to do with less. But yeah, we shouldn't be hurting some kids in order to to help others. And no, that we we seems- definitely don't want to take the Rob Peter to pay Paul approach to right. to funding schools, and and nor do I want schools pitted against each other or any of that piece. Um, so I appreciate that feedback, and certainly can take it back to the team to make sure that um, we're really thoughtful and transparent with the library media specialist community, so that we understand how we prioritize that. The one thing that you did mention, though, that I think is important is, and and again, not getting in the weeds of this particular interest uh, incident, but um, it just made me think of something. Um, school budgets often do take care of things for loss or damage. If it, you know, there's a process within a school. If a student checked out a book and they lost it or if a student damaged a book, a lot of those individual title replacements would be a part of the the school budget process because they would have the ability to um, engage in that communication with the student. So um, that usually happens with things like textbooks unless we see a student intentionally rip a a book in the library. Um, But I just offer that that's something I forgot to mention. Um, But to your point, the larger point is, you know, we want every library media specialist to be able to feel like they are providing a collection that supports their kids and we don't ever want schools to feel like we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. We want to then ask for more if if that's what we need. So I think that's good feedback that I can take back to the team, but also make sure that we're making clear for the library media specialists the avenues they have to advocate for that um, directly with our team so that they don't have to feel like they can't, you know, use that their voice in that way. And, th- and that was my follow up. So thank you. You sure. <laughs> um, triggered that. I wanted to ask what role they play in providing input on their allocations aside from a specific request or you know going to that because a, a lot have told me they don't feel comfortable making those requests with outside of some yeah. type of normal channel yeah. um, ask for what they need or their their principals are only asking for the mo- the most urgent needs again yeah. The board needs to see the full picture all of it. in order, yep. all of it. We need to see what the needs are in our schools. It's yep. it's that simple and that hard, right? But yep. we've even been asked at the, the county government level, level for a tiered request yep. because that's how other county offices submit their budget requests each year. They are tiered. I want to see that that dream list of yep. what, are, what our schools need because rather than the Rob Peter to pay Paul approach, which anecdotally feels like it may be happening right um let's ask for what we need and and prioritize those requests to do that and i will offer that i will take that back to the to the library media team in particular um just so that i can you know, talk with the team about how do we establish that so that it's also not reactionary. I don't want them just engaging in this conversation once somebody's disappointed in their allocation. I want to create a space where we can ask for what we need. And and the tiered approach that you shared, I think, is really powerful. It's the one that we use for um, requests in my department for curriculum. Um, My teams have to rank them. They have to identify priorities based on the teaching and learning framework, based on new courses, new requirements from MSDE. Um, I do uh, subscribe as Dr. McComas and Mr. Hartlev will tell you. Um, I usually ask for the unicorn and sometimes I get a puppy and some years I get a turtle, right? Like, but I I put out there what I wish for in terms of um, identifying the needs. And I think it is important that we tier those requests. And I, I do think there's growth in how we structure that process because I'm not so sure that it isn't um, you know, this is the funding I have and I prioritize the needs within the funding. We also want to make sure there's a space to say, and here's the funding that I would need to really adequately meet those, I think is is an opportunity for growth for us in that process. It is, and also to um, prepare our school administrators because they're overseeing their budgets as well. If an allocation is going to be short of what they may expect, do we have a process in place or if not, may I recommend that we put a process in place to alert them to that so that they can plan ask for the difference appropriately mm-hmm. too, either to ask for the difference or prioritize within their own budgets if they know something's coming up short. Um, something else I've heard is that these reductions have have caught some some folks off guard and we don't want that either. Um, they should have the information they need to plan And if we're planning to reallocate resources based on whatever criteria have been determined, 
then we we want our schools to be able to in the to loop that information and to be able to plan ahead for that. And I think the board would want that information too, so that we can help ask for what we need to avoid Great. that. Yep. Great feedback. Yeah, and just then I'll take that to um, once we um, identify who the um, permanent chief of schools will be, because I think that that's good uh, work, uh, good information and insight for the chief of schools to know as they help lead principals and prepare principals and all these skills. Um, and, and our, of course, our partnership in that work as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just have one follow up question. Um, Ms. Ken, how many library media specialists have complained about their resource allocation? I was going to move on to the next to Ms. Domanowski to move the discussion further, given the time at hand. No, I, I understand that, but I'm just wondering because if it's if it's system wide, you know, I'm just looking at prioritizing the the urgency of you know what the board may need to address. So if it's two library specialists versus fifty, and so I'm just trying to because I haven't heard it. And so I'm just wondering, like, how, do, do we have a number of of people that have made this complaint? School staff have complained that their allocations across categories, not just library materials, but across um, budget categories, have been reduced to their one to their surprise, and that school administrators have had to supplement their allocations for those reductions. Just to move on a little bit, um, usually if there's, you know, one or two people, especially in that role, as far as, you know, a, a media specialist or a, you know, a teacher complaining, there's more than just one behind them. They're just the one brave enough to speak up. So I, I, I think that this is something that we should look over across you know, make it more formal, like a, a more standard approach for all, like to run all of our schools better so mm -hmm. that, you know, you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul and that, you know, we're having enough money for every department in every area. So I, I, I think it's worth looking into across the board, not just for, you know, library supplies, but for all schools um, budgeting wise when they, you know, are making their budgets. If they are to know that, you know, hey, you're not going to have enough money to to fill this certain category, you need to think about that or if you request more money or you need to find somewhere else, that, that's a good, um, something to look into if we can help that. Um, I would wanna thank um, Dr. McComas and Ms. Shea for all that information and for staying with us so late tonight. Um, unless there's any, I don't wanna cut anybody off if anybody has any more comments or questions. I just, I just wanted to uh, follow up on my previous comment because I do think it's important that we quantify our numbers only because what I'm getting from parents is, um, you know, when we say some or or they or, um, you know, we, it's important to put some context behind it. Um, and so that's just what I'm getting from parents. And so I just want to make sure that that's out there, that um, that, you know, they've heard board members say they have said, and there's a lot of people in there, or they might not, there only may be two or three. And so that's important just for transparency for the public. If we, you know, just begin to quantify when we say that staff has said, it's important to say, well, five staff, has, they've, staff members have come up to me. Now, sure, they may represent more, but I think it's important to quantify the numbers because what I'm getting from the community and from parents is, well, how many people are saying that? Who, not necessarily who, but they want to quantify the numbers so that they have that context. Um, so that I just wanted to make that point and um, and just bring up why why I ask and and just know that moving forward, I will always ask that question because it's coming up more and more um, and from from what I'm hearing from constituents. Thank you. And if I may respond to that, Ms. Domanowski. Sure. Um, I'm hearing, you know, one district out of what we have seven in the county wide i can only speak for those that that come to me and it's a small portion um, of that but by and large almost every school has communicated the same concern about allocations 
being reduced in some category. And I, I only bring up library books as an example um, to learn more about how these allocations are determined. Um, it's not library books at every school in the fifth district. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in some category, they've seen reductions that they've questioned and that it has um, been a burden on school administrators to reallocate their own school budgets to compensate for that reduction. So thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, no, thank you. If I may just offer something um, for consideration moving forward, just with all of the whole conversation, you know, I think one of the things that we have room to grow on um, as a community around our budget um, process is just building that capacity at all the levels, right? So when I hear um, faculty saying I'm concerned about budget reductions and principals are concerned and we're concerned, right? I think what it, it makes me think about what are the areas for us to um, improve our practices at every level of stakeholder uh, so that people are we have like proactive management of understanding and expectations and um, you know I've worked in some other school systems in the state and one of which um, the budget process at the school level uh, teachers were required to be part of that budget development process as were parents um, and so that all the stakeholders at the school community level understood what were the dollars that the school had to work with? What were those collective decision points around how those dollars were allocated? Uh, so for example, were we allocating dollars to materials? Were we allocating dollars to staffing? Um, and where do we make those really tough decisions with, you know, we every budget has constraints. Um, and so I just offer, there are some other um, school systems that may have examples that would help us uh, with building that capacity um, from parents all the way up through through us as you know um, senior leaders of the organization and and board members. So I just offer there there are some examples out there that we might uh, want to look at and think about how to proactively um, apply, especially considering in this next budget cycle we recognize that those supplemental ESSER grants are coming to a sunset. Um, and so we'll be um, having to make some really intentional decisions about what shifts from the grant one to the FY25 operating cycle. So thank you. And it would help to see some of these reports in terms of which allocations are being reduced because we have a surplus. We have a general fund balance that the board has um, directed be used intentionally previously. Mm -hmm. So it's concerning when I hear that school allocations are being reduced when we're sitting on a surplus that could perhaps be used to to absorb that and sure. to make them whole. We we at the very least we should be maintaining our funding because we know there's a constant stream of needs. When I hear that school funding is reduced in any area, that's an immediate concern. Mm -hmm. Not to say that there are priorities everywhere and and I'm not arguing that it's we're not prioritizing appropriately, but we shouldn't be reducing when we're sitting on a, a general fund surplus that could be boosting these. I agree. This year's money for this year's this. children. <laughs> we need that. We need yeah. the data on which allocations are being reduced in order to make those decisions, and that has not been transparent or available to the board. Understood. Thank you, Ms. Hunt, uh, and thank you, Ms. Berger Dwyer, and thank you, Dr. McComas and Ms. McShay. Uh, Ms. Shea, sorry, I don't know why I said McShay. Ms. Shay. Uh, I'm Irish. McShay works. <laughs> <laughs> what soon to be Dr. Shay at some point? Yeah, I yeah. think in the next My what, six months, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Hartlove, Ms. Faya, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for September. Uh, 20th, unless we do something in between, but I will be in communication. Um, if there's any further business, hearing none, uh, please have a wonderful, relaxing vacation of some sort before I see you again and tell me <laughs> all about it. Have a great night. Thank you very much. Have Thank a good you, night. everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you.